guys, it's here. Episode 100. Our road to 100 has featured some of the best guests I've had on the show yet. Craig Ballantyne has been on SideQuest Podcast. Greg O'Gallagher has been on the podcast. Greg Knuckles, Tony Gentlecore, Jen Sinkler, Jesse Neeland, Mike Vacanti. So, so many amazing people who write and create some of the best fitness content out there as well as amazing guests that you've probably never heard of, like Roz the Diva. Tanner Bays, you've probably never heard of Tanner until you've heard Tanner come on the show. Travis Pollan, Matt Dustin, all the guys who join us for Coach's Corner, and myself, Robbie Farlow. I cannot thank you guys enough for listening to 100 episodes. Episode 100 is even big. It's even bigger. It's, it's one I have waited, one I have strived to get on the show for a very long time. My mentor, the man who inspired me to get off my ass, get myself in shape, and start my own journey to building the the heroic superhero body that I've always wanted. The one and only John Romanello is episode 100, and I'm so excited to share it with you today. Just a heads up on this episode, there is a little bit of echo in it. Uh, Usually when I record, I'm recording with people via Skype. We did this live in person in New York City because I'm a part of his business, Mastermind. We were at the Mastermind recording. So there is a little bit of an echo from the uh, room that we were in. I've worked with the audio as best I can, uh, but just bear with it. We only have 30 minutes. We had a lot of speakers uh, in New York City, so we were very, very short on time. We crammed it in. We had a good time talking about uh, Disney movies, his writing, uh, geeky stuff, music, and, and everything else. If you're not following me on Twitter, head over and follow me at SideQuestFM. You can follow me on Instagram as well at SideQuestFM. Head over and like the Facebook page, SideQuest Fitness. You'll get updates on podcast episodes on Mondays. Taco Tuesday, where every Tuesday I give you a badass, kick-ass taco recipe that you can create. Workout Wednesdays, uh, Thursdays, some sort of throwback Thursday or some sort of shenanigan. And on Fridays, I tell you some secret that I've never told anyone in full disclosure Friday, Uh, but we talk video games over there, we talk fitness, we talk sports, we talk whatever happens in the social realm. So head over and like that as well. If you want to see more of my private life, more of the shenanigans that I get into every single day, or just want to ask me a quick question, follow me on Snapchat, SideQuest Fit. Now, if you love this episode and you've loved any of the other episodes that I have put out from amazing guests like Tony Gentlecore, Dan John, Jen Sinkler, Jesse Nealon, Mike McConti, Greg O'Gallagher, Greg Knuckles, and so much more of the 100 episodes I've created, if you could head over to iTunes and please leave a review on iTunes, I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Helps us move up the charts and helps more people hear the amazing guests that have come on the show. But we're just not on iTunes anymore. SideQuest Podcast is also on Stitcher. We're also on SoundCloud and now on Google Play Music. So if you have an Android device, you can listen over there as well. So leave your reviews there as well, and I will check those out. I'm going to get into the episode. Like I said, it's very short, but a couple of announcements that I do want to give out about the podcast. A challenge was laid down to me recently uh, to do solo episodes. So announcing before we get into episode 100, on Mondays, you're going to have the same interviews with the same people in the fitness industry or people with amazing stories that I want to get on the show, people I want to learn from. You'll hear those every single Monday. But starting this week, starting in July, you're going to get solo episodes from me every Thursday. They'll be brief 10, 12, 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes if I ramble. But in, I'm going to talk about things that I don't normally talk about. We'll talk fitness. We'll talk business. We'll talk video games. I'll rant on E3. I'll rant on sports. I'll talk about the books I'm reading, things that inspire me. I'm going to get a little more personal in these solo episodes. But any questions you have that you want me to venture into, hit me up on email, sidequestfitness at gmail.com. Send me your questions. I'll answer them in a solo episode or do an episode full of questions. Um, But every Thursday, you'll get a brief little solo episode from me uh, now that I'm 100 episodes into the podcast. So something new and exciting that we're going to be doing here on SideQuest Podcast. Guys, again, I cannot thank you enough for listening to 100 episodes. If you really do enjoy the podcast, please share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, share it on social, and let more people know about the amazing 
people you hear every single week uh, in the in the show that I've put together over a hundred episodes. But I don't want to hold back the episode anymore. It's short, it's sweet. We only get about thirty minutes, but it's really great. Uh, John is a huge influence on every single thing that I do. I have learned so much in this business mastermind. I've learned so much in following him over the last few years. And I hope that someday I can give as much value to you as listeners, to you as readers, uh, as he has given me over the last few years. But without further ado, let's do it. Let's get into episode 100 and hear from the man who inspired me, the man, the myth, the legend, John Romanello. All right, guys, welcome to episode 100 of the podcast. I'm super stoked. Uh, I have my mentor, the man, the myth, the legend who got me in to all of this, uh, whose book inspired me to start my fitness journey and then now becoming an entrepreneur and podcast host and whatnot. But the one and the only John Romanello, welcome to the show. Dude, thank you so much for having me. Congrats on 100 episodes. That's pretty huge, man. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to get you on uh, to sort of celebrate, uh, and my listeners have heard me talk about you from day one, because you've been a huge influence. You know that, I've told you, Yeah. Um, but I want them to know a little bit more about you, uh, but we'll go into a little bit, I won't go into your backstory, sure. if you want to know John's backstory, get his book, uh, I'll pitch that uh, in email and whatnot, but Man 2.0, Re-Engineering the Alpha, um, you can pick that up on Amazon, but read his book, go to his blog. I write over there. Tanner writes over there. People you hear on the podcast every day. So you can learn his backstory over there. But uh, John's a very unique guy. He's a nerd. He's a geek. Uh, he loves emo music. Like, that's why I connected with him. And he likes to lift weights. Uh, he's not a dumb bro. He's an intelligent person. Um, and funny enough, we were talking upstairs your top five Disney films, like yeah. something a little surprising I've never actually heard you talk about. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I think that everyone like, has those films, yeah. right? And I think that maybe the, the film, like, because, like, kids, kids of, of today's generation, like, kids who are, like, eight, nine, ten now, they're going to have a different list of totally different. films, right? Because they're growing up with something else. But for me, the number one is always going to be Aladdin. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so as Disney films go, like, the music is incredible. Uh, I, I don't remember the year that that came out. I know it was, like, maybe 11 or 12 um, and it was the first one had to have like crazy CGI with like the, the carpet ride through the cave. Yeah. There's something about that. And then it's just, just got to, like this strong hero and Robin Williams is incredible. So that's number one for me. Number two, I think it's a little mermaid. I think of all of the Disney films, it's got the that best one, score. That one is very surprising to, to come from you. Why is that? Like, so, you know, I have, I have an older sister and, um, and so like so much of my taste when I was, you know, like, like anyone who's got a, an older sibling, that person is cool to you. You know, because they, they just know things that you don't. And so, like, I think that when I was growing up, so much of my tastes were influenced by Jessica because um, she was just there and she, you know, we, we, uh, we had a rough childhood and so we were best friends. And so, like, you know, growing up, I liked the movies that she liked. I remember watching things like Dirty Dancing and reading The Sweet Valley High because I, I was a voracious reader. So I would finish all of my books and then I would just read whatever she had. So I read, like, <laughs> Sweet Valley High, I read the Babysitter's Club, the, Babysitter's Club, the Boxcar <laughs> Children, just because like I needed a book to read and it right. was there. So, um, to, which I think has worked out very well for me because it gave me this like very well rounded sort of. And I never, I never like grew up thinking like this is for girls and this is for boys. Right. So, um, as far as The Little Mermaid, I just think it has like the best score. Um, it's a really fun story. I, I really think as villains go, Ursula is the most entertaining. Yeah. She's, she's incredible compared to like. I mean, like the witch in Snow White, just not there's, like there's this, no, she's not, it's there's not like a, yeah, there's she's not a compelling villain. Yeah. Um, and so then others I really like. Um, Lion King is maybe like number five at, at the end of distant five. I like the Lion King because it's it's based on uh, Hamlet in a lot of ways, yeah. um, which is really cool. Uh, I you know I, I like that. It's, it also follow. It's also very similar to Prince Caspian, which is based on Hamlet. It follows the model of the hero's journey really well. Um, but I like Oliver and Company, which is very underrated. Uh, the score is by Billy Joel, who, right. of course, is uh, like me. He's a gentleman who hails from Long Island, and all Long Islanders worship at the altar of Billy Joel. And an underrated one, I really like The Sword and Stone. I think it's a pretty good telling of the King Arthur story. A lot of fun. So, yeah, but I mean, you know, if you can't talk about your favorite Disney movies because you have a 600-pound deadlift, like, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, every, everyone has them. Um, 
So I, I love that you say you, you read the box. You, you read all these girls' books. Yeah. I, my sister had all that stuff as well. I did not read those. Uh, a lot of those books were just bought at book fairs. Yeah, yeah, never, and like never the got scholastic read. books. Yeah, and, like, yeah. and they never – I mean, I collect goosebumps, like crazy. Okay, yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting that you, you just were like, whatever, it's girls' books, I'm going to read them. Right. Did that has that influenced you as a writer? Was that a good thing for you to have that breadth? Yeah, I, I think I think like the way that it influenced me was more as a person, right? Because okay. never really feeling the need to categorize things in terms of like a gender bias has has influenced my life. You know, like I'm I I am a very very vocal advocate uh, and ally of the LGBTQ community. And for me, and you know, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm a very vocal feminist, and I stand very strongly in favor of of gender equality and sexual equality. And for me, I think I think so much of that just comes from the fact that like I grew up having exposure to at, at some from a very young age of you know like there's uh, my my godfather is gay and my cousin is gay and there's just you know and I was never like this is for girls this is for boys. So and, you know even even as I grew up, you know I've read a lot of romance novels and I read like chick lit. And I'll read anything if you put it in front of me. If it's well written and it's it's like entertaining, I'll read it. And I think, you know, some of my favorite movies are romantic comedies and yeah. stuff that's, you know, maybe more geared toward women. And and you know, also consider the fact that like I grew up without a father figure until I was like nineteen. I met my mentor Alvin. So I identified very strongly with my mother, who's an amazing woman, and my sister, who's very strong. And I think, you know, I remember like the first time, and this is like a I think a, a thing that's weird for guys. When they're older, I remember the first time, um, you know, I had to go buy tampons for my mother. Like, she was just in a lot of, I was, like, 11 years old. Yeah. And she gave me 20, and she's like, I need tampons. I was like, what, did, what do I get? And so, but it was not weird for me. I was, like, running an errand for my mother. And so it's never been weird for me. I don't think, there's nothing about femininity that scares me or grosses me out. And I think that influenced my teenage years in a really profound way. And I think that in terms of my writing, what I find is that I connect very strongly, not all women, but a certain subset of very strong women who have no fear of masculinity in the way that I have no fear of femininity. Okay. And that has been really, really helpful for my career. When did you sort of like, you know, you were a fitness guy, you got yourself in shape, you've done some bodybuilding shows, mm-hmm. you've done fitness modeling. When did you start to identify yourself as a writer or have you always viewed yourself? Well, yeah, yeah. So when I was eight, I told my mother that I wanted to write a book and she asked me why. And I said, because books make me happy and I want to make other people happy. So I was a writer before I was anything else. I had my first poem published in a literary magazine when I was like nine or ten. And then, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big nerd, as we mentioned, and I grew up reading The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And then from there, I got into the Dungeons and Dragons stuff. So I read a lot of Dragonlance and Forgotten Realms when I was a teenager. And so I was just influenced by the stuff I was reading. And so I started writing short stories. And then my first short story published when I was 15 in Scry magazine, which was, uh, I don't think it's, it's around anymore, it's a defunct magazine, but it was sort of a gaming magazine that had information where you could go and like learn how to build a really good magic card deck. Yeah. Um, I played a lot of Magic the Gathering, so I, I wrote for <laughs> Sky, Scry magazine and Dungeon magazine, just short stories, and I was getting published. Um, so I was a writer before I was anything else, and I, you know, so I was always writing, I was always like really crushing it in English and history classes, and then when I was in college and I, and I got in really good shape, I approached that through writing, right? So I, I decided I wanted to learn this. So I, re- I bought a bunch of books and read them and found people whose writing I liked. And um, so, you know, the, the best way I can put it is I'm going to quote my good friend, friend Ben Bruno. If you guys don't know him, Ben Bruno, check him out, benbruno.com. Um, he's a, now a celebrity trainer to Kate Upton and Chelsea oh, Handler right and a number of other people. Yeah. But but Ben's Ben got to start. Like me, he went to an Ivy League school. Ben went to Columbia. And then he interned for Mike Boyle. So he's got like a really strong athletic background. But the best way I've ever heard anyone put this is, um, you know, Ben, Ben, when he describes how he got into writing about fitness, he said, well, I like writing and I like working out. Maybe I could just write about working out, (laughs) which is like sort of what happened for me. For me, it was like, you know, if I wasn't writing about fitness, I was always writing about something else. I've always kept a journal. And for me, like it's write what you know. And so... When I was in, you know, halcyon days in my misspent youth playing in punk and emo bands, I wrote about what I knew. I wrote, like, songs about heartbreak or unrequited love or, like, being the, the poor kid in a rich town and all of that, like, Bruce Springsteen type shit, but with an emo spin, you know, very Long Island. And so, you know, my ex- I wrote about my experience. And so as I got into the bodybuilding community, I was just like, well, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to write about it. Yeah. And um, 
because I was a strong writer, even at 20 years old, when I, I arguably didn't know that much, I was able to put together a very well-written article with a decent program, and I got published on Key Nation, and then I just kept writing. Just kept writing. Yeah. What is, so what's your advice for, like, your greatest piece of advice for writers? Because I, like, <laughs> funny enough, as a kid, I wrote a detective story about a, first story I ever wrote was on a piece of cardboard. Uh, and I gave it to my great grandmother. It was about a detective named Friday. Okay. I know, not super creative, but whatever. Uh, and uh, Casey saw, I don't even remember sure. what it was about. Um, but I just started writing and I started doing that. And I was always really good with writing papers in school, but I never saw myself as a writer until, honestly, until I started doing the blog stuff. Mm -hmm. And I really started to find my passion, my love for it again. Mm -hmm. So for people who are out there that are writers, you know, fitness people who listen to this, or even people who just, keep a journal or enjoy putting words sure. down? What's the greatest piece of advice you can give them? I mean, the biggest mistake I ever made was uh, there was a period from around 23, maybe 24, until 27 where I stopped writing entirely because I was very focused on fitness modeling and yeah. um, I was doing some acting. And I think just like not doing that is huge. Like letting letting that skill, I mean, not that, that I felt it rusted, but you know, I did have to like come back and, and like kick the rust off a little bit. I think consistency is like the most important thing. Uh, getting reps is tremendous. So write every day, you know, and I think that it's, it's really hard to write compellingly about fitness. Most people aren't completely jacked up to read about fasting or carb cycling or right. push-ups or whatever else. And uh, similarly, no, very, very few people are jacked up to write about it. But for me, the thing that has always helped is to write about things that you are passionate about and that greases the wheels and allows you to build the skill set that you can then port over to writing about this other stuff. And I think that because I spent so long when I was a kid writing about elves and dragons and, and writing like with, with passion and fervor, yeah. uh, when I was able to write um, when, or when I wanted to write about fitness, I was able to do that with a great deal of skill and ease. And, you know, I've never been particularly shy. What this is, one of my earliest influences is Tucker Max, yeah. who's, who has since become a good friend of mine, but I remember, mine, but I remember, but I remember, but I remember freshman, maybe sophomore year of college. And this is when Tucker's blog, tuckermax.com, which was, I think, like a, a Zenga blog, yeah. started blowing up and getting passed around. Like the first, you know, email was the first viral sort of communicative process. And everyone would send this around, like, you got to read this, it reminds me of you. And I really loved the way that Tucker was able to write creative and entertaining nonfiction. Right. And that sort of influenced my writing. And T.C. Luama from T Nation was very influential to me. And just being able to put my personality into my writing and, you know, the, the, like knowing when to crack a joke without it feeling forced. And, you know, if you read my earlier stuff, there's shit that doesn't hold up because yeah. maybe it was a little too, too topical. Um, and, and, you know, 10 years later, it's not relevant. But, uh, yeah, that, I mean, just, just doing it consistently and writing about other things allowed me to develop that skill set. You know, the, what I enjoy the most about the book is you base, you know, Alpha on Campbell. Mm -hmm. So why is Campbell so important to you? Why, is, why does that mythos work for everything? It's Star Wars, The Matrix, Harry Potter, like, right. everything has that sort of Campbellian Sure. I mean, you know, so so for those who don't know, Joseph Campbell was a, a comparative mythologist who taught at Sarah Lawrence University, and he looked at myths across cultures and really focused on where they converged rather than where they diverged. Right. And what Campbell found is that most great stories, most not all, but most great stories have this single narrative thread that they follow, this cycle called the hero's journey or the monomyth, mono meaning single, obviously, it's this single story told a thousand different times about a hero and a mentor, a villain. And, and this journey that it takes. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's similar, you know, it, it, there's, there's Harry Potter and there's Luke Skywalker and there's King Arthur. And then, you know, there's Dumbledore and Merlin or uh, Dumbledore and, um, and Obi-Wan and Merlin. And there's right. always these, these figures in great literature and they really fit well with the Jungian archetype, archetypes. And what I think that it's, it's just the way that we tell stories, not because they're easy to remember, but because they resonate with us because it's also the way that we process change. As to why Campbell's important to me, you know, for me, it was like the right book at the right time. Um, I found Campbell when I was 19 in a, it was a mythology class, I guess. Um, yeah, because it was like part one of a two, of a two course um, thing. And the second one was about like comic books. <laughs> so, um, and that's when I read Watchmen for the first time. Um, so I found Campbell and I had a strong background in mythology because I was really into like Greek and, uh, and Egyptian mythology when I was a kid. 
And um, it really, it really resonated with me, and I really began to like it. But interestingly, this finding that was sort of concurrent with me going through that fitness transformation. And it wasn't until a year or two later that I was able to go back to Campbell and realize that beat by beat, the journey that I went through when I went through this fitness transformation followed the path of the hero's journey from the call to adventure to refusal of the call to meeting with the mentor. And that works in uh, relationships. It works in building a business or, or, or any major change in your life. And so I wound up writing my thesis on Campbell um, and feeling very, very proud of, of this very obvious thing that Campbell you know, had said repeatedly, which is that this applies to just about everything. And so that's sort of become my thesis for life. I personally believe that the, that understanding the hero's journey is not only a great way to understand stories and to become a better storyteller, but I think that it serves really well as sort of a, a thesis for self-development and or directed self-development and a tool set for problem solving. And so that's that's really what the next book is. And, you know, like it, it worked very well for the framework of Alpha because, again, my fitness transformation when I was 19 or 20 uh, followed that hero's journey yeah. at the same time. And so, the, you know, Alpha is intended to be both the call to adventure and the guide, the mentor guide through the ordeal of that transformation and allowing people to come out on the other side and be the master of two worlds. And um, I, I just couldn't think of another way to write that book. Yeah. So this, the next book is not a fitness book. It's not a fitness book. It's basically, the way I'm trying to think of it is um, in much the same way that Ryan Holiday's The Obstacle is the Way yeah. is a great introduction to stoicism and also ha is, is actionable in that regard and teaches yeah. you how to use it. My next book, I would really like it to be an introduction to Campbellian theory, but also a very actionable um, uh, uh, piece of literature that that you could use to actually like solve the problems in your life or, figure, or, or really a good tool for self-analysis and problem solving. Um, you know, so we're here at the Mastermind, your business Mastermind. Mm -hmm. You've got a ton of people in the fitness industry or in, in different industries, you know, working sure. to grow their business. Uh, you know, as I've told you a million times, you've influenced so much. And there's so many things that I, I've that sit in the back of my brain, mm -hmm. like from this already, uh, you know, that, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. I like, I wake up and I make my bed and like, all right, that corner. It, nope. Nope. Because if yeah. I don't do that, like I'm not, I'm going to apply to my writing later. Right. Is there something that like someone, a mentor, an early mentor that's still in the back of your brain, like every day sort of short echoes? Um, yeah. So my mentor is a guy named Alvin Batista. He owned the gym where I, I first joined when I was 19 or 20. And he um, like helped guide me through my first transformation in a number of ways. Uh, he paid me for my first personal training certification, and he really became his mentor and his father figure for me. And I began to, I worked at that gym um, on and off from the time I was 19 until I was 27. And I didn't stop, even though I had so many other opportunities to leave. I didn't really leave until after my online business had taken off. Even after like I launched my first product and my business was doing you know, 30 grand a month, I stayed at that gym for six months and like helped hire someone else to run it and and ease the transition because it was a, it was a big touchstone for me. But Alvin. Uh, showed me a lot about life. I learned a lot about like being a father from watching him with his three daughters. And, uh, but, but one of the things he told me that really stuck is you, you regret the things you don't do a lot more than the things you do. And it's this really simple thing where I think so many of us get, get scared to take risks or to make changes. And, you know, I have this, because I am so emo, um, and probably in part because of, of my particular psychological makeup, I have a really strong tendency to live my life looking backwards. And so I can't undergo a lot of situations that will result in regret because I am not like currently um, emotionally capable of not regretting things. Like a lot of people say I live life without regret. I, you know, I look back at shit I did when I was 20 and I feel fucking terrible about it. So for me, it's just like, I'm always trying to like make the right decision and do the right thing. And I think because my father was not a good guy to my mother, I mean, he was very abusive to me and my mom. Um, like I, it's very important. It's one of the driving forces in my life that I am a good man. And for me, I think that means looking at every decision. And this again comes from Alvin and it's, um, he said that every, every decision you have to make is an opportunity to show your quality. And so living my life in a way that like 
I don't regret things like taking chances and doing things for myself, but also trying not to burn people. Yeah. That has been a, a guiding force in my life. And, you know, I think like when in doubt, if you don't know what to do, when you're in doubt and you can't decide between two things, just do the right thing. Do the thing that like, if you told people about it, you'd feel proud. And that is how I run my business. It's how I try to run my life. And obviously I'm not always successful there. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that I've done. I'm like, you know, it was probably not the right thing to do, but you know, you learn. And for me, you know, those are, those are two like really important guideposts. Yeah, I, I agree. There's, I think that's, you want to do the right thing, but it gets confusing sometimes. And, sure. And honestly, you know, it's, it's, you make those mistakes, but it's learning. Sure. Yeah. Well, the, the danger there for me is because I, I do have a, a psychologically diagnosed zero complex, very, very <laughs> often, uh, and that, but that's very common among, yeah. among um, uh, uh, sons of abused mothers, yeah. so the need to protect I, the people same, around Same them. here, same here. Um, yeah. So the problem for me arises when, for me, the right thing is always putting myself last and, and yeah. like taking care of people, and as soon as someone in my, in my life has a problem, it, I immediately go into the mode where I'm like, I'm trying to fix it, and not only does that create issues for me, you know, like, I can give you an example. Um, you know, a couple of years ago when I first started seriously dating Negar, who, who I would eventually marry, one of my ex-girlfriends was in a bind and she, like, wanted to invest in this business. And she hit me up and she asked to borrow, like, 20 grand. And I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah, like, I'll, I have 20 grand to give you. It's not like it's sitting in a bank account. I'm happy to do it. And I did that because, like, I felt the need to help this person who I used to have a serious relationship with. And it, like, then became a conversation with the woman who I was going to marry. And she's like, that's... We got to talk about shit like yeah. that now. And so, you know, the impulse to help someone created a problem in my life <laughs> that I then had to deal with. And that is something that I, I like have to consciously, like, I really need to like look at things and look at the spider web of how this is going to affect things. Because otherwise I'll consistently fuck my life up to help other people and I'll just fucking deal with it. And I, I try really hard not to do that. Um, Good. So, I don't feel so alone now. No, it's, I, yeah. like, I, do, I do the same thing. I'll sacrifice like. We'll be out, and I get an email or a text from somebody. I'm like, they need help. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta go right now. No, we're on a date. Shut the fuck up. Like, right, exactly. Out. And and so there, it becomes this thing where you're going to constantly sacrifice, you know, your own happiness for other people. So you know, I do think that there is some nobility in that, but um, it's it's it has been a, a lifelong process for me, or at least you know, my adult life, to learn when that is appropriate. And it is this process where I'm learning, and um, it's very difficult. So, you know, the, the thing about having a hero complex is knowing when to exercise that, that thing. Because not only is it, is it not great for me and some of the people around me, it's not always good for the person. No. You know, like a lot of people need to help themselves. And, and you know, and I, I wrote in the, the article I wrote on depression um, is I have, I have this really bad, like, thing that I've done, which is I've trained all of the people in my life to expect me to be the guy that's always going to help them and always going to be there. And I've always been very clear that like, I don't need anyone to, to be there for me. Yeah. And then when I slip into, you know, an actual depressive state and I can't fulfill these things and then people are, are like disappointed in me because I can't fly to New York to fucking fix something for them because I live in California. Um, it creates, it creates real issues. So that is something that I've been really trying to work through. And it's been, um, it's been a challenge, but it's been obviously a big, a big, uh, piece of growth for me over the past like, two years. Yeah. Um, so we're keeping time a, a little short because we got a lot of exciting mm -hmm. a lot speakers. Of, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of mastermind to do. So let's get to some fun questions that yeah. I always ask. Uh, if you could go anywhere in a time machine, where would you go? Anywhere in a time machine? Um, I would... I mean, I would love to meet Thomas Jefferson. I, w I, I would really... There's this, um, if, if you guys haven't seen it, there's an HBO documentary, or not documentary, it's an HBO miniseries called John Adams, mm -hmm. starring Paul Giamatti as John Adams, and, um, and it's, it's a six-part miniseries, and it was fucking incredible. But the, in all of the, the, the thing, there's this one scene, and it's um, Adams and Jefferson and Ben Franklin, when Jefferson first, the, the he, he first yeah. presents the written version of the Declaration of Independence to um, Franklin and Adams, and they're basically, you know, like... Uh, there's, there's a great book called Thomas Jefferson, Author of America by Christopher Hitchens. And Christopher says, like, uh, Hitchens says that, like, Thomas Jefferson didn't uh, just come up with the idea for America. He more or less designed and built it. And just to, like, see them discussing the Declaration of Independence, to have, like, been a part of that, I think, to, to be able to witness that would be would be really amazing. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I think that there's some some things that I'd like. Uh, yeah, I guess I'd like to just like go it's, back. Just, it, it's funny that you mentioned Thomas because I actually had a question. Oh, like, let's let's hear what, if, if you were alive because he he's a little bit of a paradox. <clears throat> yeah, uh, when you look at his political stances on things and things that he did. Sure. So, like, what's the one question you would love to ask TJ if he were alive? I, I want to know if he's proud of us. You know, I think that. I think that of all the founding fathers, Jefferson had the most optimistic view of the ideology of the American experiment. And I think that, you know, if you could take Jefferson, if you could pull him out of that time and sort of sit him down and over two years, three years, educate him about what we've done and how and, and where we are now, I would I would want to know if he was proud of us. I really think that he was one of the greatest thinkers of his age or of any age. And you know, he, yeah, he's this paradoxical character, you know, and he says, um, slavery is an abomination and must be loudly proclaimed as such, but I own that neither I nor any man have any immediate solution to the problem. And, you know, here's this guy who clearly, in all of his writing, it's very clear that he, he detested the idea of slavery, but, you know, he's a white landowner in, in the slave-owning South in Virginia, and, like, he just, you can't not have slaves because the economy would collapse, his, his, like, family wouldn't be able to survive, and I think that weighed heavily on him, and I, I would like to know you know, what he thought about how long it took to, you know, I'm, I'm from a mixed race family. My dad's yeah. side of the family is black. So I, I would like to sort of know, you know, if he feels okay with how long it took or the way that we've handled it since then. And, you know, if he would, I'd love, I'd love to set up a meeting between Jefferson and Obama and see how that went. I, I just, I would want to know if, if the, if he, if in his view, the experiment worked. And I think now, with the country being so completely uh, polarized, more polarized than at any point since the Civil War, yeah. and you know, I, I would, I would just, I don't know, like maybe, like when you look at, at at what we've got going on versus the UK, would Jefferson be like, you know what, should have just, should have just, just, just left, yeah, should have, should have just like left it alone. Yeah. I don't know, um, but. Uh, I, I do like to share this quote about Jefferson. There was, um, I think it was in like 1962, Kennedy had a, a dinner for a number of, uh, of Nobel Prize winners and poet laureates, and he said, I think perhaps this is the greatest collection of talent and intellect that has ever been gathered at the White House, except perhaps for those nights when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. And um, yeah, so yeah, that's, I don't know, Jefferson I, I think would would be a very interesting guy to talk to. All right, so we got we got to wrap up because we got things. But this question is: yeah. I posted this on I read it, Emma last year when you launched mm-hmm. um, uh, Omega. Yep. So I got I got to ask it. Let's do it. In the future, humanity picks their leaders by having them fight to the death, while the rest of the world watches mm-hmm. like American Idol, mm-hmm. and they vote on what or whom a person faces. To make this more exciting, a young man has invented a time machine to go back in time and pick out five of history's greatest heroes mm. and its greatest villains yep. to bring them back to fight to see who will be the next so, leader. You okay. are that person. All right. Well, I, I think um, if you're really looking at, at some military geniuses, like Alexander the Great would have to be one. Um, you know, uh, I think that um, Genghis Khan would mm-hmm. be in there. I, I don't... I, yeah, but the thing is, it's like... Everyone thinks they're the good guy. Like, yeah. are these people really villains really, or heroes? Yeah. But I, I think that Alexander the Great would be fantastic. I think... I'd be very interested to see how Napoleon would handle things uh, against Khan. Um, I am I am sure that if I really fought hard, there would be uh, someone um, who would be a truly emblematic of of like sort of the medieval period in terms of like chivalristic combat. Um, I don't know uh, Doc Holliday. I think would be right. great. yeah. I, I like I'd it. love Doc Holliday. Um, and then Teddy Roosevelt. You know, I, that would be, I tell you, <laughs> I, he's, I just a, he's just a stone cold badass. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know, and um, that's a difficult question. But I think, I think that ultimately, what what would happen is like, in terms of single combat, someone who who just had a lot of martial prowess, like an Alexander the Great, ultimately is, and and, and Teddy Roosevelt is going to win over someone who you know might be more of a tactician. Right. So. Um, I don't know. I mean, if the fate if the fate of us all rested in the hands of those particular <laughs> men, I think no matter what happened, we'd be fucked. But it would be interesting to see. It would be interesting, yeah, interesting to see. So 
Uh, we're going to wrap this up. John, thank you so much for coming on. If people want to know more about you, they can find you on Twitter at John Romanello, yep. Instagram at John Romanello, uh, Snapchat at John Romanello. Very creative. RomanFitnessSystems.com. Get over there, check out the articles, read all of John's stuff, uh, and pick up the book on Amazon as well. And, of course, anytime John puts something out, I'm going to promote it because John's the fucking man. Like, there's a reason why I follow this guy. He loves emo music. He loves Star Wars. Like, as soon as I read those things in the book, I was like, done. I, this is the guy I need to follow for the rest of my thank life. Thank you, man. That means a lot. And thank you for having me. Like, thank I know you. the 100th episode is a big deal, so it's yeah. nice to be the guest for that. Thank you yeah. so much. And guys, thank you for listening. Guys, I hope you enjoyed episode 100. If this is the first episode you have checked out of SideQuest Podcast, head over to iTunes, hit subscribe, and you'll hear from more amazing guests like John, uh, Dan John, Greg O'Gallagher, Greg Knuckles, and so many, many, many more that I've had over the last 100 episodes. Check that out on iTunes, also on SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Stitcher as well. Leave reviews over there. Thank you guys so much for listening to 100 episodes, and I cannot wait to share more of the awesome guests that I have lined up with you in the future.